Matrix Reloaded, Explorations in Directed Acyclic Graphs. Um, slightly technical terminology. Um, my background is in computer science with a very, very small piece of maths involved in that. Um, but the last few years I've been working uh, for LPL Archaeology on some of their digital initiatives. Um, now I will start with an apology that The Matrix Reloaded, not a great movie. Let's just pretend it never happened, okay? Um, as, which is what you may want to do when you see some of the matrix diagrams and drawings that I'm about to show you, because they are not pretty either. Um, basically, my interest in the matrix and Harris matrix, very different to the matrix we saw this morning, by the way, far prettier thing this morning. Um, my interest comes out of the 100 Minerals project that we uh, worked on last year as basically a total of 12 months excavation on a major site in the city of London that produced a very big Harris matrix and trying to deal with that and help the uh, field staff um, pique my interest because the tools that we have are not very good. Um, for those of you who may not be too familiar with the single context recording system um, invented by Molas and used by most uh, people on deep stretched urban sites. Um, basically you have a site grid, five meters by five meters, and you have sheets of permatrace that you do your planning on. You draw your context, one context at a time, single context recording as the name implies, <coughs> um, on your sheet of permatrace. And as you dig down this you know, virtual grid square, you record the stratigraphy of it, the sequence of the Harris matrix as you go in each grid square. And once you have that grid square completely done and all the other grid squares completely done, you have, well, you have this running matrix. You then reduce the matrix to its minimum um, diagram. You combine them all together, reduce it again, integrate the non-planned fills, because you've only, in theory, only planned your cuts. You need to put in the fills into the uh, matrix then. You then subgroup them and group them to do your analysis. So, you know, that cut and that fill, well, that was actually a part of a Roman ditch. So we will group that together and that Roman ditch was part of a wider drainage system. Therefore, we'll put that into a group. So that's sort of basically how the whole system works. Now, on small sites, you can get away with just drawing that on a single piece of permatrace and doing the maths by hand, because it's quite easy to see where you have redundant lines, just rub them out. Um, quite easy to do. You know, that works well up to, you know, 30 or 50 context numbers, not too bad. But on larger sites, um, it starts to get to be quite unwieldy. Um, you don't want to be sitting there drawing um, 300 or 3,000 contexts manually by hand, or as some of the big sites that they get in London, there's rumours of places like Spitalfields in London where they had in excess of 10,000 context numbers. So. It's a very interesting problem to be um, addressed by computer systems. Um, we, once we're finished, uh, ooh, that's in slightly the wrong place. Anyway, um, that's basically the running matrix that you get on, on your uh, permatrace. Um, once we've done all that, we load it up into um, the ARC database that we use and where you can query your matrix like that. It's, it's a very simple representation of it. And we'd like to have a far better way of viewing that as well. Um, so at 100 minerals, as said, it's a, you know, it was a 12-month um, excavation, and it was 1,283 square metres, 72 grid squares, 3,000 contexts. We dug down eight metres from street level to the bottom of the London Ditch, which uh, went around the outside of the London Wall. Um, the longest path in the matrix we produce is 177 contexts deep, and the matrix covers 46 A4 pages. The first time I printed it, I stuck it together using sellotape, put it up on the wall. Looks wonderful, uh, but yeah, that's really not practical. Um, that's just a large section that we drew across the ditch. Unfortunately, I forgot to put the scale bar on it, bad job. Uh, but that's 35 meter long transect across the, the, the city ditch. Um, so this is Mansa, who um, was my slightly willing guinea pig for the last couple of months. Uh, she's been, she's one of our senior arcs and has been taking care of the paperwork on our site that we have in Southwark called uh, St. Olaf's. And it's her first ever attempt at doing post X. And she agreed to be a willing guinea pig to help me try find easier ways to manage the matrix. This is a nice sized site. Has, uh, they were on site for about three months, produced 300 contexts. 
So it's a reasonable number to experiment with and see where you can go. We also came up with a fairly simple <coughs> matrix. This is what your classic matrix looks like, what your average archaeologist might expect to see. Uh, there's a couple of crossings in there, a few things over top of each other. That's a fairly simple thing. Let's test that was the idea and see where we go. So let's look at some of the software options that are out there at the moment. This is the classic one. This is the Bond Archaeological Software Package. Um, it's about 25 years old. It's DOS. Stopped running after Windows 7. Probably not the great choice, but it's what we used on Minaries. Um, so we want to get off this. Uh, problem is, it's, it's great for doing data entry, but coming from the DOS era, well, the, the, the graphs look uh, pretty, pretty basic. Um, it's also closed source. And uh, you'll notice that it doesn't draw crossings. It just draws double boxes around them and tells you to do that yourself. And it does fairly nice looking diagrams. Like this is the, uh, the Olavs, no, actually this is Minaries. And so it, it draws them fairly well, but like we said, doesn't cope with crossings very well. Um, and is a bit of a dead end. Now, Emily Herzog, who wrote um, the, the Bond package, then wrote Stratify. Um, which is probably the most widely used package now. Still runs on Windows. It's got a GUI. Again, still closed source. Um, it has its own database built in now. It's basically tried to be an all-in-one solution for you for your entire site needs. Um, but drawing got worse. How can it get worse? Well, it did. Um, that is incredibly complex. And you go to a larger site. This is Olav's. How are you supposed to follow the lines in that? Worse, when you start drawing in groups and subgroups, well, that's, um, which is why Mansa in the picture earlier had that highlighter sitting there drawing things in nice pretty colors on all the graphs. This is, shall we say, slightly disappointing. This is the license terms for Stratify. Um, Code's a confidential secret. You won't attempt to reverse engineer anything the software does. There's a lot of research that went into BOM and Stratify. There are a lot of academic papers published that gave fairly high overviews of this is the algorithm that's used, but the code's unavailable. And the detailed algorithms and the corner cases and all the heuristics and little things that you learn from doing this, writing software like this for five or ten years, they're completely lost. We have no access to it, and it's a dead end, basically, for taking Harris Matrix software forward. ARCID, there's another software package out there, or at least it used to be until the university that wrote it uh, redesigned the website, and it completely disappeared from the internet. <coughs> it also has problems drawing, uh, drawing graphs, and the more complex graphs that Olaf's it struggles even worse with. Again, this is, I'm not sure it's something that you'd want to be looking at and trying to, to, to decipher in any kind of logical way. More recently, there's been a package called Harris Matrix Composer. Wonderful, nice modern package, uses Java, cross-platform. Fortunately, um, and I believe it was even funded by EU money, but it is closed source again. Um, you're limited to a trial version of 50 units, after which you're expected to pay. And it's got really bad data input. It's really slow. You click one button at a time, type in your number, click, then draw the lines, click. Draw. It's really, really painful. It has no data import. I can't imagine trying to enter 3,000 contexts into this package, um, even if I wanted to. And as you can see, the, the simple drawing is, it looks fairly OK, but hey, it could be better. Which is, disappointing because um, it uses a drawing package called YWorks, which is also used for this graph edit editor called YED, which is free to use, download, uh, no limits on it. It can draw automatically really good looking simple matrices. Fantastic. I actually use this for the smaller sites that we do. Um, doesn't cope quite as well with the larger things, that's Olaf's, but it looks a bit more like what we're expecting. So hey, there, there could be a future to this except it's closed source. And it's Java, and I'm not a Java programmer. Uh, I'd much prefer C++ and Python and the likes of that. Graphers has been proposed by a lot of people. It's a ubiquitous package. Um, you'll find it on pretty much every web server on the planet and being used to draw WYSI graphs. 
but it has a real problem with drawing orthographic edges. Um, I'm not sure I'd want anyone to look at something like that. And when you draw straight line edges, it yes yeah, struggles as well. It doesn't look great. And especially when you move up to the so nail I was one, it can't even draw things in a straight line. Now you can do stuff with the weighting of edges to tell it to keep things straighter and that, but really it just seems like too much effort. On, on the, the data display side, there are some people doing some interesting ideas. Uh, Catalhoic, as you would expect, have some interesting things going on. When I saw this, I got very excited because I thought, wow, they've cracked the drawing algorithm. It looks fantastic. Until I uh, had a chat with them and found out that that is actually hand-drawn in Excel and then noted in Photoshop, and they did that for this one single building only. Um, they would love a better automated solution to this. Um, something that looked like that, but at the push of a button, they would love. That took them a couple of days. Um, but it sort of shows you the promise of, OK, interactively exploring a site archive uh, by zooming up and down the matrix, it's a doable thing. In fact, IADB does it as well. Um, I think you could probably recognize that they're probably using graphers here for drawing their, uh, their graphs. But they've got a nice little mini map in the corner there. And they've got the groups nicely set out. OK, that's, that's looking quite cool. That's getting towards the sort of thing we're wanting to achieve in ARC and the ability to query our data sets. Um, but having gone through this sort of review of all the software, basically ruled them all out because they're, you know, quite frankly, the, the drawing is pretty poor. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to follow the lines most of the time on a very large graph. And you know, you certainly wouldn't want to put that on your web page, you know, for the public to interact with. Um, the manual data entry is just slow. Um, they're quite monolithic and inflexible. If you're wanting to integrate this with your own database, they're trying to make you use their database. How are you supposed to set up a work efficient workflow around that? Um, you know, it's quite poorly documented um, data formats that are being used. And based, you know, the worst thing for me, I feel, is that it's all closed source. There's no improvement happened basically in 25 years as what is, you know, basically a core tenant of archaeology and, you know, single context recording. There's also no way to verify that the algorithms they're using to reduce your matrix is actually correct. You're blindly trusting them. And, um, you know, I do actually trust that uh, the, the early programs were doing it right because they obviously must have had some kind of verification suite before they released them. But who knows? You know, I can't stand up here and say that they get the correct result. So we've sort of broken the, the, the problem domain down to three areas that we wanted to address ourselves. One's the process side of it, to get the data in, validate it, reduce it. Second stage is, OK, well, how do we store this data? You know, we need a file for, for both archiving and for interchange between um, various use cases for it. And I know that the ADS has some interest at the moment in how to archive um, Harris matrices. And then there's the visualization step, the laying out the graphs you know, for people to explore or interact with the data. So they're three domains that we're looking into. Archives is existing Harris matrices is one that I've deliberately put off to one side. I have messed around a bit with scanning existing hand-drawn ones and trying to um, vectorize them and OCR the numbers. And it's a rabbit hole I've decided I don't want to go down. Um, and the existing LST files will hopefully be taking care of the other thing. File formats, uh, pretty much the, the backbone of which you know any workflow data processing will have to hang. But you know the Randall Munro of XKCD has you know Randall's law. You know don't go around creating another standard. It's tempting to create a new file standard, but it's not a good thing. LST file format that's the de facto standard from BOM and Stratify, but looking at it, it's just not viable for for archival purposes. I don't want to create a new standard. I'm not the sort of person who has the qualifications to define a new standard. We need to adopt one of the existing file format standards and just adapt it to our needs, which graph formats like GraphML and GML have the ability to attach attributes. And if we define a profile for that um, file format, then we can use that for interchange. Except if I'm wanting to load up several thousand context relationships into my database, do I really want my database to learn how to read GraphML? Um, really all I need is a CSV list of the relationships. So perhaps we only actually need, perhaps we need two formats. Uh-oh, proliferation um, could be a problem. But 
it may just be a very practical <coughs> response to um, practical problems. In fact, Randall Monroe XKCD has a solution, your universal converter box. Um, I think I've pretty much used every single one of those at some point in my life. Well, except maybe not the MagSafe 4. That's my, my power cord is getting that way, though. Um, well, we have actually written the universal converter. Uh, for want of a better title, it's called Arc Matrix. It's up on GitHub if you want to have a look at it. It's a Python library and command line tool for converting um, matrix file formats, um, particularly getting in your, uh, your old LST files and putting them into a somewhat more archivally stable format. Um, but it will also validate the matrix for you, report any cycles, reduce the matrix to its minimum, and uh, report to you what it's done. Um, it doesn't do any graph drawing or layout as yet. That's the next thing I'm going to talk about. And data entry stuff is in progress. So graph drawing, drawing theory, it's a pretty specific set of use cases that we have. We have all these um, constraints that we wish to apply to graph drawing that no other use case or found matches. So we're pretty unique. Um, there's, you know, we basically want top-down drawing and those to float to the top and all these pretty orthogonal edges that carry information and concentrated edges and ports. And then we're adding in subgroups and groups and periods and phases and same as and you know, how do you cope with that? You know, that's a pretty unique set. Um, it's similar to organization hierarchies, UML diagrams, sort of. I wish it was a lot similar to chipset design because then somebody like Intel would have thrown an awful lot of money at the problem and would have solved it for us. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of money. Um, we also don't have a lot of expertise because it turns out drawing an optimal directed acyclic graph with minimal crossings is NP hard. For anyone who's done any kind of uh, computer science maths will know that means it's basically impossible to do in real time or any acceptable period of time. So people use heuristics, and there's all sorts of different heuristics that have been developed over the years. Uh, PQ trees used by BOM. The Sugiyama and Shimani has been used in Stratify and Arcad. Um, but to get archaeologically accurate and aesthetically pleasing edges, I think seems to be the problem. As we've seen in those graphs, that, that really does seem to be you know, the, the central issue that we're finding problems solving. So I've been dredging my way through the Journal of Graph Algorithms and Applications. Wonderful open access journal online. Great for those long sleepless nights, 3 a.m. in the morning when you're struggling to get to sleep. There's a couple of algorithms I want to highlight. One that caught my eye about a year ago when they delivered a talk is Overloaded Orthogonal Drawings, which the summary sounded very close. But this only just been published, February 2016. I haven't read the paper yet, so I'm just going to skip that. One that I've been playing with is column-based layouts, which was published just over a year ago. Um, as you can see, it's, that picture is what caught my eye, everything neatly lined up in columns. Um, it was developed for an academic uh, package for drawing arguments and um, Socratic discussions and things at a, at a university. But what really liked, uh, grabbed my attention, the GPL implementation in C++. Excellent. I can run that. And that actually drew pretty good results straight off the bat with no tweaking. Um, tried it with the, uh, the Say No Lives data set. OK, there's a few issues, but it's looking promising. I haven't had time to actually go in and iterate over this um, to see if I can get the, the edges and those to concatenate properly. But it's, it's, it's a promising approach. That took about five minutes to calculate, though. I tried uh, throwing our Minaries data set at it. Um, after four days, I decided to kill the job. <laughs> so uh, obviously, there's some efficiency work to be done there. Um, but we've got to thinking, well, maybe this isn't the right approach, drawing an entire matrix at once. Whoever needs to see that? OK, maybe a project officer when they're doing subgrouping grouping, that analysis phase. But if it's slow and non-interactive, well, they can cope with that. When you're wanting to display a nice matrix for people to interact with on your website, you know, you don't want that slowness. Maybe all you need is a small sub-view at any given point in time. And so we've been looking at ways of doing that, um, whether you start at the group level, zoom down to subgroup in the individual context, maybe, um, or you just show X number of generations before, three generations before, three after. That's another option. Maybe we use the context data itself to tell us how we should be grouping these in a semi-automated fashion. So if you've got a cut, 
and directly above it is a fill, you know that that fill goes in that cut. Well, you might as well just you know, tell the graph drawing algorithm, can assume those two should be drawn close together. Um, there's, there's things that we can do like this that, that are good areas for research that uh, we're wanting to start to move on to. So in conclusion, it's slightly frustrating input, validation, reduction, that basic bread and butter of it should have been done 25 years ago, but we've been held back by closed source. I'm a big open source fan, as you can probably guess, um, and I think that, that that is quite sad that we've had to basically reinvent the wheel. Um, we need to sort out the archival uh, and interchange format. Um, I've got some proposals for that. I'd love to talk to the ADS guys at some point this year about that. We're working on the data entry stuff at the moment. Moving the graph drawing forward is a specialist domain. It may be too hard for us. We may need to find academic partners somewhere who uh, specialise in this sort of thing. Um, and then once we have the tools in place, uh, you know, some kind of drawing toolkit that can do wizzy animations on the, the net of a Harris matrix, then we can start playing with how we display this stuff to the public and communicate maybe a, a new way of interacting with an archaeological data set instead of just static records. And that's pretty much where I want to leave it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to thank my colleagues at LP Archaeology for their perseverance with me um, and to uh, also to our project officer, Chiz Howard, who is the absolute master of deep strat and has taught me everything I know about Harris matrices. Uh, so thank you.